Thank you. Over to Dr. G. Nice, Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. Thank you, Dr. Tina, uh, for uh, the elaborate introduction. Mm, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shibu uh, Simon, for inviting me to this webinar. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to be associated with my trust. Uh, I've been there several times on several occasions for several purposes. And I had a good contact with people who had walked over there. The college uh, established well, and the programs conducted by my past are well rated. Uh, and I'm sure that it is one of the best uh, self-financing uh, institutions in the state of Kerala, probably in the country. I, I'm extremely happy uh, on this pandemic time when uh, the entire Kerala is uh, on lockdown, uh, mainly because the spiking uh, in the corona cases is very high and it's unfortunate that we had the maximum deaths uh, yesterday. Uh, today, I do not know, but then uh, this makes a, a very serious alarm. Uh, probably the Institute of Advanced Virology, which we have established in uh, Trandum, uh, by the government of Kerala uh, would be able to help us to overcome this crisis, especially uh, to manage the crisis, to manage the pandemic, and then have uh, come up with maybe, I don't know, uh, the Institute may not be able to do much uh, for the current pandemic, but I'm sure that it has always a futuristic approach and definitely it will be able to uh, take up the challenge and to uh, manage the, the infectious diseases, uh, the pandemics in the course of uh, I'm, I've, I've been asked by uh, Dr. Shibu that uh, I should go general uh, because uh, he said that the target is students. So I wouldn't venture into a technical uh, talk because uh, we, uh, I, I have uh, my uh, inter-university center for genomics and gene technology, there are about 15 people working. And that is my current strength, uh, where they're working on different aspects of uh, uh, human uh, biotechnology, animal biotechnology, and plant. And being uh, the co-founder of that uh, center, I have a claim in all those that all the development that happens. I am now associated with CLIF, uh, the Central Laboratory for Instrumentation and Facilitation. As the name itself indicates, it's a, it's a, it's a center with iron instrumentation open to all the people uh, in Kerala as well as in uh, We have qualified trained technicians, either you give your samples here and get your work done with interpretation, or maybe that you can walk in, learn how exactly it's being, because I always prefer that the students would uh, see how exactly the programs are managed, you know, the instruments are handled, uh, so that uh, they will be able to confidently say that they have had some experience on the equipment. Uh, but it's an open place. Anyone can walk in. And then uh, if, you, if you have any uh, queries, you can contact uh, through the website, through the email IDs that is given uh, in the, the university website or maybe Cliff. Uh, being associated with several institutions in the country, and being uh, closely associated with the development of biotechnology in the state of Kerala. Uh, I have been uh, doing the humble way, uh, whatever I could to promote biotechnology. Uh, before I go further, let me uh, share my slides. Of my slides are visible. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, now yes, sir. Uh, I had given uh, several topics to Dr. Shibu. India chosen me to speak on this, uh, and it is a challenging topic, especially to speak about the paradigm shift that has happened in biotechnology. That's very important because uh, as when you when you when you look at what is happening, uh, biotechnology is always 
for the benefit of mankind. Anything that you do onto the biological organism, you improve its efficiency, they improve its status, which it could not uh, until the biotechnological intervention came in. So that the biology, biological organisms per se, or to the process that the organisms do should be improved. But then when they improved, when they are improved, definitely it should benefit them. And that's the major thing that you should look into. Because when you look at the biotechnology programs uh, that are happening in the state or in the country, most of them are still at the basic level, the theoretical biotechnological approach. Probably you are addressing several problems, but then most of those research programs do not reach the society. So unless and until a product, if you, if you look at this and just put this uh, to help you, uh, understand this. You know, if you if you if you see this, we have uh, research happening, uh, biotechnology research happening uh, all over the country. We have several biotechnology institutions, dedicated biotechnology institutions, and biotechnology is being taught and practiced in different uh, other uh, institutions, universities. But if you look at what is happening, is that the research ends up in uh, you know, maybe, for, for example, you take uh, the, the PhD work of a research student. What the person does is that maybe spending a lot of money, uh, putting a lot of efforts, uh, the ultimate result would be that the person gets a PhD. Uh, in addition to that, he might go in for publications. Uh, some publications are being done because uh, publications are very important uh, to take your career on. You will go for some inventions very rarely, and probably there are places where patents are being introduced. But they do not turn into products. Real biotechnology would be that when you translate all those research findings and jump this, this uh, valley and uh, reach uh, the, the other uh, peak and then try to go do something for this. By way of producing, pro making processes, producing products, or probably you get into uh, establishing your, your own startups or uh, entrepreneurial ventures by which the society. So what you have is that you still are into the basic biotechnology aspect. Uh, unless you jump and translate your research, you don't reach to the applied one. Biotechnology always look for the applied aspect. Applied aspect in the sense that anything that you do I should reach the society. It could be anything. Uh, it, it, could, it could be, for example, when I say this classical example, uh, biotechnology has great, uh, done great. Because of the interventions, the advantages of biotechnology that you could come out, come out with very valuable vaccines, which are targeted ones. Uh, if you look at the vaccines available in the country, see, for example, uh, the Bharat Biotech's co-vaccine. Covaxin obviously is an age-old technology that they are uh, inactivated virus uh, being used, but then to make uh, the virus inactivated, you need to grow the viruses. To grow the viruses, handle the viruses, you need to have specific facilities. Facilities in terms of a biosafety level, minimum at the level of biosafety three, preferably at the level of four. The highly sterile conditions, every protocols are to be maintained because as you know that you're handling with very deadly viruses. Uh, probably corona is not that deadly, but when you compare with Nipah or maybe uh, Ebola or many other viruses, that are very, very dangerous and nasty and uh, the mortality rates are very high. For example, in Nipah, it is said to be more than 60% where it, uh, in the case of uh, uh, COVID-19, it is to the level of two to three percent. But what is important is that the vaccine, the first vaccine, as I said, that is a major technology. It is purely indigenously uh, made by Bharat Biotech in association with ICMR and National Institute of Biology. Look at the other two vaccines, other vaccines that are, and for example, the one uh, which is extensively being used, Covishield. Uh, manufactured by the Zerum Institute, but they have not made this vaccine. The vaccine was made by the Oxford University as well as in, in association with another company called AstraZeneca. Uh, when this was done, uh, what they did was that they have taken adenovirus, uh, 
replication deficient adenovirus into which they have incorporated the spike protein genes. So when uh, the, the virus, the vaccine is being made, uh, when the vaccine is being injected, what it does is that it starts expressing uh, the viral spike proteins and that would create an immune response in your body and the virus. So understand that the spike proteins are a product of genetic engineering. It's a strong component of that. So COVID shield is a product of biotechnology and maybe that uh, I don't think that any vaccine has been developed can can be uh, developed so fast as that of the vaccines. So COVID shield is said to be a very effective vaccine, but then obviously you need to take booster doses. Uh, and once you do that, you get the other one, the Pfizer vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine is again uh, is very important. It's a pure uh, mRNA based vaccine. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the shell of the virus proteins, uh, genes are being, uh, uh, mRNAs are being uh, loaded into uh, nano lipid particles and that becomes the vaccine for Pfizer. Of course, Pfizer vaccine has not been, not come to uh, India, but uh, they are uh, in the process of getting it. But in the US and other places, it is extensive. The third uh, vaccine, which is now started uh, use in the country, is the Sputnik vaccine, Russian vaccine. Uh, it's again um, an adenovirus uh, technology, uh, wherein you have uh, DNA uh, being incorporated into the RNA being uh, now made into DNA and incorporated into the viral adenoviral genome, and then that also. So uh, the, either it is the encapsulated nucleotide modified mRNA encoding mutated uh, full length spike protein like uh, the, the Pfizer vaccine or the enveloped protein in the case of Sputnik. But all these, if you look at it, except for the, the, the covaxin, all those being developed are products. And probably that's the reason that we could come up with a vaccine because we started realizing uh, the pandemic status of COVID-19. Uh, though we had the, the, the MERS and the SARS virus in the past, but nobody had ventured into making a vaccine that way. But then it's a product of one and a half years. It's very, very difficult to make a vaccine that way. So for that matter, understand that many of those uh, clinical trial, trial processes or regulatory, regulatory uh, requirements are not fulfilled completely uh, because you cannot do it very fast. What I said is that this is what the applied research is, that you might do it. Probably there are people, vaccine candidates, there are several vaccine, vaccine candidates being developed by different laboratories in the country. But none of them have gone into an industrial level development, or none of, none of them have been translated into a research, uh, translated into a product. And that's the whole problem uh, regarding this. So what is needed is, this is where the paradigm shift is. That you need to look at the biotechnology as a science for the society. To make it a science for the basic learning, you can do it because basic learning is very important. There are no number of uh, programs where uh, you are going in for making uh, basic research. And uh, basic research is something which is a treasure trove, which would become very, very highly useful in the course of time. So you need to specifically understand that and then try to come out with something which would straight away go to the society. There are, there are a number of opportunities are there. You could go in for an entrepreneur. Uh, you can go for startups, Government of India, for that matter, uh, uh, Science Engineering Research Board, Department of Science and Technology, uh, BRAC, all those agencies are there to support you. And, but then how do you realize? Probably uh, your, your pro findings may not lead into a publication. If you're career savvy, then definitely uh, that is not a cup of tea for you. So you need to specifically publish it. But then, even if you publish it, that you could, uh, you know, do go for patenting, if if you want to protect it, or maybe that patenting what means that you you close your uh, finding for about 19, 18 to twenty years, nobody can touch. It. So that means it becomes a useless uh, exercise 
unless you translate it into product. What I said is that it's a credit. If you have a, a, a patent, of course it is rated for your career. But what is important is that you need to specifically translate it rather than um, putting the rights uh, exclusively with you, go to the companies or maybe start make startups, you know, because I tell my biotechnology students uh, everywhere I go, I tell them, motivate them saying that you could be uh, not just job seekers, you could become job providers by starting your own startup. You do that. I'm sure there are a lot of opportunities available, a lot of fundings available, soft loans. Maybe that uh, there are agencies in the state itself that they would give you uh, soft loans, or maybe that uh, non-returnable uh, loans. Maybe what they demand is that you should, once you once you establish a con an industry, uh, probably they would become partners, or maybe that they would try to. Uh, if you are, because it's for the society that you do it. So there are opportunities, but uh, it's risky, obviously. You should be daring, venture into something, an entrepreneurial venture, or maybe a startup, probably you should be there. Uh, there are classical examples, for example, Kiran Majumdar, uh, the Biocorp. I, I remember her when I was in TBGRI. She used to come to TBGRI for many months. Uh, very humble, simple lady, but imagine 20 years. The growth she has made, she has become an international giant. Perseverance, determination, hard work made uh, Kiran Mazumda to become one of the pharma giants in the world, uh, competing with many of those major. So probably there may be a humble beginning for you, but then once you launch it, once you succeed, I'm sure that great things are going to happen. So understand that the best thing that you should, when you practice biotechnology, always target it. To, for the production. Uh, for that matter, anything that you raise, at the, what you call as bench to bed side, uh, you develop in the laboratory, uh, translate it into a feasible product, and then tie up with agencies. Either you give your know how to a company to make it. And now, for that matter, people are trying to take the know how uh, from, from, from AstraZeneca uh, as well as from Pfizer, and the people are trying to have. Uh, many uh, vaccine production because that's what is needed. So my first point is that when uh, uh, she would told me, Dr. She would told me that we need to uh, specifically look at the paradigm shift. This is what I tell you that please go for making your biotechnology visible to the society, reach the society through a product or a process. And I'm sure that we will have most of this, and I'm sure uh, COVID uh, probably will be there for some more time, unless and until we get all the population uh, vaccinated, uh, COVID to COVID will be there. Probably after everyone gets vaccinated, COVID be just like a like a, like a like a common cold or something of that sort, because they won't be able to do havoc or spread like what is happening. So it is necessary that we need to understand that, uh, like what the vaccines being developed by companies. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, you know, Oxford vaccine, uh, you understand Oxford University uh, uh, made the vaccine and associated with uh, AstraZeneca and then the Zero Institute who has tied up with this, they are manufacturing. And the major provider for the country uh, is the COVID shield, which is manufactured. It's a biotech product. Pfizer's product is a biotech product. Uh, Sputnik is a biotech product. So there are a lot of them. Please understand that. And maybe that you all, you all could make your uh, system work better. Now, uh, my, my topic, as, as, as I said, that I've just gathered uh, a lot of information from uh, different sources. Uh, I would just categorize it in genomics, human genome project, gene, gene genetic engineering, gene editing, stem cell technology and 3D printing, and artificial intelligence and synthetic. Just categorize. I don't know whether I will be able to complete uh, all these topics within uh, the ambit of my uh, limited time, but I will not because uh, I will talk for some time. Probably I will stop. For some time. Now uh, look at genomics. You know, we are into an era of a revolution of a revolution in genomics. Every organism is sequenced, uh, sequenced for uh, its its nucleotide sequences, so that you would understand the organism much better. For that, uh, you know that a genome uh, is an organism complete set of DNA in all of other things, which has got the capability of reaching. It has the total, or maybe that a totipotent 
genomic component is the gene. Not important. In the sense, it could generate a complete organism. Because that's how uh, you look at it, because the complete genome. Uh, they say uh, after the human genome project, there are about 3.2 billion nucleotide base pairs uh, that makes up the human genome. But then just making it ATGC, uh, nothing else. Uh, you know, there is no sense. Maybe that it's like a beads on a string, you have ATGC being run. That's the sequencing. But then meaning out, how do you take uh, that where the genes are, what is the sequence in a gene, and then how does it go for translating into a protein? So well, that means uh, you need to look at the different components of uh, genomics. Uh, and look at this, you have, uh, you have the, the genome and the study of genome as genomics. Uh, uh, then the product of uh, genome is a transcriptome. You call, there were big science associated with it called as transcriptomics. And the final end product is the protein or pro proteins which are being produced uh, with the message content. These are all classical things which you have learned. Metabolomics is the, the, the complete metabolic processes. It's an amazing array of metabolic processes, very specifically, very sensitively, and very in a coordinated way, all these metabolic processes. You, have, you understand that if there is any fault in the metabolism, metabolic disorders, which will lead to several, several metabolic disorder related uh, human ailments. So most of them are, it's very important you need to understand. Uh, and then what is important is that when you do all those things, it's very important. It's not just sequencing the DNA, but also to understand how exactly the sequence give a need. Uh, the Human Genome Project for that matter was launched in 1990. That time it was envisaged to read the complete genome of the human beings. Uh, initially, uh, it took a lot of time, but later now uh, the sequence can be done at the nick of the time. There are a lot of advances that has been made. But imagine the breakthrough that has happened in 2003 when a, a, a nature paper appeared where uh, the entire complete sequence of DNA was specified. And but still, we were not clear of how many genes are contained. It took a lot, a lot of So, uh, the, you know, uh, it was a joint association of U.S. Department of Energy, National Institute of Health, along with Silera Genome, it's a private company, and a consortium of a number of countries putting their efforts together made this possible to make what is known today as low human or, or uh, human blueprint, DNA blueprint. Uh, if you look at this, this are, again, then the whole thing has become uh, uh, very complicated. Uh, you know, when you say that we have we are a functional organism, we say that we have everything uh, by which we can dominate the nature. But understand that only about 1.1 to 1.4 percent of the DNA in your genome is is function, is put to function. The rest is all uh, transposons, intergeneric DNA, duplications, uh, repetitive sequences, uh, microsatellites, mini satellites. Uh, and uh, RNA being transferred for several other purposes as building blocks of other kinds of things. But the translated product was transcribed to one into mRNA and subsequently is very dangerous. But then it would have been wonderful when you do this sequencing and find your 2% uh, of uh, functional DNA on one side of your gene. It is not. It is interspersed within, uh, within the genome and probably to find out is a big, big Herculean task. Still, we are not sure how many uh, genes are contained in the human DNA. We will say 25,000 genes, we will say 20,000 genes, we will say that it may be lesser than that. So that means this is, this is, this, this is what uh, the greatness of this science is, that with less number of genes, you do wonders compared to the other organism, your rice or other organisms have much more uh, uh, number of genes. So it is very important to understand the genes, gene functioning uh, for controlling many of those genetic diseases. It is very important that you need to have uh, a location specific uh, presence of genes so that you will be able to do this without tampering because you don't want to have uh, a gene to be inactivated to have another gene expressing uh, what you call as insertion, insertion, 
in actually it was happening uh, before the human gene in 1970s when you started uh, the genetic engineering that's what that was the main problem couldn't uh, so as i said that uh, it codes about 25000 uh, protein genes uh, encodes uh, 25000 uh, proteins genes uh, and you know the, the great thing of uh, about this is that the proteins the native proteins are not functional they are made into structural protein. They are made into enzymic proteins, uh, which go into the structural component of the system as well as regulate the entire metabolism. So probably, if you look at the system as a whole, it's very complicated. So uh, and then uh, it's like uh, finding out a needle in a haystack that you find out this two percent of your DNA which is functional. All these developments that have happened within about thirteen years. As I said, about 10 years, uh, the, the system was very slow moving. Uh, the main reason being that the sequ sequencing technology uh, was very poor. Uh, it was, there was no much of uh, speed in sequencing. So, uh, but we relied on the great uh, finding of uh, this, this great scientist, Frederick Sandy, the father of uh, sequence genomics, uh, you know, one, one among the four scientists to win two Nobel Prizes and the only one to receive both in chemistry. <laughs> this is something. You know, we have seldom people, maybe that you get a, a Nobel Prize in chemistry, you might go in for getting another Nobel Prize in physics or probably uh, in, in your, in your uh, uh, medicine, uh, physiology and medicine. But then this man got it and he got Nobel Prizes first for sequencing the insulin protein. In 1958, he got his first Nobel Prize and then again for the Sanger sequencing, which you know, Profoundly called and uh, you extensively use. Uh, he shared that with a few others, but 1980 he got Nobel Prize for that. It's very simple. Uh, you know, you have, uh, you should also understand by instance that when you go in for sequencing, well, these days you can outsource in my center, my center, we have uh, the next generation sequencer as well as sanders. You give a sample, you can get it sequenced. Uh, but then, uh, that's what uh, not what I always encourage. You should come, learn how exactly it's being made, and what is the process. Sanger sequencer, uh, it does this that you have. Uh, it is just an amplification process connected with the polymerase chain reaction, which was done by uh, Carrie Mullis, got Nobel Prize uh, for his in chemistry for his outstanding. Uh, the, the sequencing process, the polymerization process, everything became very easy uh, with the, this machine. Which he has devised. Uh, what is being done here is that you have dideoxynucleotides because you know that the chains of nucleotides are connected to the hydroxyl groups. So dideoxy uh, is where one uh, hydroxyl group is absent. So what you have is that uh, the, uh, in the process you mix your pool of nucleotides with that of dideoxynucleotides, which are lab labeled differentially with fluorochromes. And when you go in for sequencing it, the unknown it goes this way. Uh, uh, and then stops where it comes to the uh, dioxin. Similarly, it is thousands and thousands of reactions uh, done, and then you get the sequence depending on the color, uh, the fluorochrome uh, of the dioxin where it is being terminated. Your uh, corresponding nucleotide is being uh, looked into, and then. Uh, now it has become uh, next generation sequencing. You have several big, big companies. Uh, I tell you that a human genome can be sequenced within about one or two hours uh, with the advent of the technology itself. Which took one uh, nucleotide to be sequenced, it took several days, uh, but now it is that within hours together, you can sequence any genome. So for that matter, most of those organisms, the genomes have been sequenced. These are the sequencing, uh, it, 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 what you call as sequencing platform. So uh, the sequencing has helped us to understand. Now these days, uh, you just put any of your DNA, uh, go, 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 give to sequencing agencies, you get the nucleotide sequences, and then try to go for using your bioinformatic tools to uh, what you call as find out either from the existing sequences available or you kind to uh, uh, assign uh, meanings uh, into the sequences. So you have now, and there are a lot of advantages. But I'm, I'm just coming to the, uh, the, the most important and the most versatile 
and the most uh, the fastest sequencing process is the nanopore sequencing. Uh, is a single nucleotide uh, used very thin membrane uh, with nanopores. So when a, when the DNA is pulled out through this pores, if you just look at it, uh, this is the pore. Uh, when you when you pull out your single strand of DNA, each uh, nucleotide would give a current. So at, you just pull go on pulling it. Up. I I said it's not you are pulling it up. The machine. You put your DNA uh, single strand of DNA uh, is being pulled out, and then you will have uh, and then you got the current. complete uh, sequence being available. Now laptops, you know, see you just see this. This is the sequencing machine, miniature sequencing machine. It can do uh, a lot of uh, small uh, scale sequencing. What you do is that you have wells here uh, into which you pour your uh, isolated DNA, close it, and uh, the reaction will happen. The sequence will be done, and you will have a result. So the, the genomic revolution is solely dependent on two things. One, Sanger's uh, dioxy method of sequencing, and the other, uh, the, the carry is polymerase chain. Uh, both of them got Nobel Prize, uh, and both uh, uh, findings have become uh, great for the science of genomics to understand. Uh, with the human genome uh, applications, you know, in medicine and for example, uh, you have gene testing, pharmacogenomics, uh, gene therapy in the sense. The testing, very, the, I, I shall just explain this. Uh, see, uh, clinical, clinical genomics, sequencing technology support, patient diagnosis and care. Healthcare professionals are, uh, use diagnostics about 70. Now, it is at this juncture, I would say, uh, the detection of COVID-19 diagnosis you know, uh, done now in about 35 institutions uh, in the state of Canada, uh, uh, companies, uh, you know, both uh, all those uh, put together, you have uh, RT-PCR PCR based uh, sequence uh, method of DNA amplification. So what you need is a uh, reverse transcription PCR. Some of those molecular biology gadgets that you will be able to go into. Private uh, hospitals are doing it. Uh, it has become, but then understand that uh, clinical genomics uh, identification, disease identification, has become very easy because of this evolution in technology. So real-time PCR is just, and obviously again, uh, Tamin and Baltimore who have identified trans possible. So because uh, reverse transcription is based on the reverse transcriptase which was identified by Tamin and Baltimore, called this Taminism, retroviruses, especially the one which, but uh, you know, the viruses which carry RNA during the COVID-19, uh, anything that you need to you need to go for reverse transcript into DNA and then go for amplification. So that's what the RT PCR uh, does. Uh, genetic testing is very important because most of those diseases uh, we have several databases where uh, the ailments are given. So once you have the sequence available, you can blast it and find out what your uh, genetic defect is. There, there are there are a number of uh, tests available. Now, uh, what are this, uh, you know, patient's DNA, uh, you see, for example, uh, it could be a prenatal uh, screening, a fetal screening, uh, because you don't want any baby to be born with uh, genetic defects. So in that case, you need to go in for finding out. Uh, so uh, newborn screening, prenatal diagnostic screening, for example, if your baby has got, or your fetus has got some genetic defect, uh, the best thing would be rather than looking at the baby uh, to leave with the ailment, terminate, and then you do that. Uh, you could also go in with the genomic uh, thing uh, that to go for gene therapy. Uh, gene therapy is uh, uh, where it's, it can be a normal gene can be inserted in a non specific location within the gene to replace a faulty gene. Uh, so it's a wonder that could be done. You know, you are born with a genetic defect. So could it be that you can control? correct your, your especially for example, uh, for uh, diseases which are blood borne. Uh, what you normally do is that go for a gene therapy using your uh, bone marrow cells, 
And you, if, for example, sickle cell anemia, it could be cystic fibrosis, or maybe many of those uh, specific uh, diseases would be uh, either uh, insert a, a functional gene, which would uh, silence uh, the 40 gene, or maybe that you can swap it with a normal gene uh, with a, through a hormone homologous. So, uh, or maybe that you can go for correcting the, uh, see many of those bone marrow uh, replantation programs do this process. Either you have a, a right donor of bone marrow which does not have disease, or maybe that your own bone marrow can be corrected. So, uh, so maybe that uh, you would be able to go in for uh, doing this gene therapy, or maybe that you can go for uh, targeted therapies, uh, especially for cancer. You know, like the chemical uh, treatment that you take, uh, you swallow, you take the medicine, either injected or maybe that you take it. Understand the kind of uh, damage it does to the normal cells. So unless you have a targeted delivery, so you have specific surface proteins uh, uh, receptors on the surface of the cancer cells, which can be targeted, and the drug can be delivered into this world, either through nanotechnology or probably through ligand receptor sensitivity. You can target your drug. So what happens is that your drug goes into the place and delivers. Uh, this uh, this again is another uh, offshoot of uh, your uh, genetic uh, 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 DNA. Uh, sequencing that the junk DNA, uh, where we have come out with valuable uh, inferences like Fire and Mellow getting Nobel Prize in 2006 for uh, ready physiology and medicine for their uh, finding of RNA interferons. Uh, with that, we have gone for several applications of uh, the, uh, the Craig, uh, Mellow, and Andrew Fire, uh, their findings. They got Nobel Prize, but then microRNA, which is my uh, genomic center. We practice microRNA uh, for uh, angiogenesis, uh, the, the development of vasculature uh, in, in uh, cancer uh, tumors, because uh, if you can stop angiogenesis, so there are indications, there are microRNAs which are specific for that. You could use them, try to stop uh, the angiogenesis so that the, the tumor will not be there. We also have uh, programs conducted in ECI, uh, uh, you know, ER stress conditions. And specific. One of those novel developments which one of my students uh, has done in association with RISE to find out biomarkers, microRNA biomarkers for cancer. So when you have none, empty number of microRNA RNAs present in your blood cell, if you isolate them and then characterize it, uh, through a defined technology, you can have specific MR, which are indicators, you know, indicators of an ailment, a particular cancer. So all these are uh, micro RNA uh, technology. It could be specific uh, uh, purposes it could be used. Uh, you will be able to either exogenously applying micro RNAs, you can stop an ailment because you will not be, you know that micro RNAs normally go for uh, sli slicing your uh, mRNA uh, so that the protein is not. So you could do use uh, exogenous micro RNAs or you can make genetic engineering to build your own micro RNAs within the uh, genome so that they will continuously produce micro RNAs and then stop process. Uh, genetic engineering for that matter, obviously we have uh, the first uh, one, even before the genomics uh, was done. Uh, in 1977, uh, you had uh, somatostatin, the first peptide hormone produced by recombinant bacteria. But of all that, the best product of a biotechnology, genetic engineering, cumulative. All the insulin that is being used today by the the diabetic patients. Uh, diabetic is a common feature. So every uh, diabetic patient, when there is an insulin therapy being done, they use what is known as the human, human insulin being produced by uh, bacteria. And with, through a very complicated process, now we have all those 
uh, human is, because there are no other way, way uh, that you can because you have been using uh, the, the bot uh, insulin uh, that does not uh, have a, a conformity with the insulin that is produced so that causes allergy in many people. Uh, the transgenic animal was produced in 1981. Uh, Fice patent for uh, a live organism was done by Ananda Chakrabarti on pseudomonas. Uh, the buck, the oil eating buck, was done and is said to be the uh, human made intervention, uh, invention, and then uh, it was one of the first life to be painted. Plants also, uh, you know that. Uh, you have created a lot of, I will not go into the details of it, but I said, uh, being a plant science biotechnologist, I should also say a few things about plants. Because that's also very important. Uh, you can go in for making, uh, instead of going to a breeding program, you can target, like, have the desired gene and incorporate it through a genetic engineering program precisely at the place you want and you have you can have the expression. And for that, what you need to do is a construct, a gene construct uh, with a promoter, which is specific to the uh, organism or a plant where it is to be done. Because, uh, you know, you, can, you cannot have trans uh, promoters. You need to have promoters of the specific system. So for all those successful genetic engineering, you had this. Uh, the first one, which is now in farmers field, extensively used is the BT cotton. Uh, BT cotton, uh, the bacillus thuringiensis, is crystalline protein producing genes have been inserted into the plants and then you have uh, what you call as uh, defense against uh, helicobacter, uh, armigera, uh, uh, a polyphagous uh, raceous feeder of most of which devastates many of our uh, canopies, uh, especially cotton. And now cotton is being served, immunized, you know, because uh, the worms cannot eat away uh, the worms, uh, the, the balls, or what you call the bottom balls, or maybe the leaves uh, through this technology. It is now the only, the only plant genetic engineering or genetically modified crop to go to the farmers. None of there are several technologies like BT brinjal. Uh, you know that the brinjal uh, is damaged by the, the insect like this, and and look at this BT brinjal. It is done. But then still, uh, it, is, uh, it is not allowed because we have a string, strict legislation, uh, biocontrol mechanisms where you, you know, bio uh, safety measures where you're not allowed to put the BT branch on. Into the, plants. the technology is available. Um, I'm told that uh, Bangladesh, uh, most of those uh, brinjal cultivation over there is the BT brinjal developed by us, but then we are not in the position to make use. See that uh, brinjal variety, uh, Tamil Nadu Agricultural University, so so nice to see it. There is absolutely no uh, insect as in larvae uh, inside it. They don't burrow uh, it and go inside and eat away. Maybe I do not know why it is being done. And this, this again, GM mustard. Uh, developed by Deepak Penta, Dr. Deepak Penta of Delhi University. A very harmless uh, technology. Nothing happens to the organism. It is just because mustard uh, is very important. Uh, what he did was that he borrowed, uh, a, a, he called us Dara Mustard Hybrid 11. Uh, he borrowed uh, a, a genes from different sources, uh, bar, Barney's Barstar genes. Uh, Barnes is, is a, uh, is a gene that codes for a protein that impairs pollen production. So because it's essentially, you cannot do a crossbreeding in Western. So once you have this Barnes gene available, it stops pollen production, okay? And then you breed it, uh, 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 the parent plant, another parent uh, with that of Barster. Barster is something which will counter the Barnes gene. So maybe that your hybrid, will have no barnace being expressed, it still becomes new. So this is this is a challenging thing that the only fault that uh, Deepak did was that to go in for the bar gene, uh, which, which is a herbicide tolerant uh, gene. Uh, uh, it is a uh, gene against uh, a, a, a herbicide produced by Bayer uh, called as Basta. So probably that's the reason people say that 
uh, it should not be uh, used. And there is no potassium going to the farmer's field. The technology is still there, purely developed by the, the Buck Pentel and his group in Delhi University. Unfortunately, you know, maybe this is something where you need to intervene by technology. Uh, you, you make a human cry that your product doesn't reach. And this would, would, have, would have been the product to reach the society to make the farmers to get uh, better benefits, better crops, uh, and stop using uh, uh, the pesticides, which are extensively damaged. See, for example, you know what has happened in, uh, in Kasargod, endosulfan area, uh, or maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, many places uh, in, in, in the country where a uh, lot of health problems are created by the excessive use of pesticides. Uh, for that matter, Kutanat, uh, the soil has become infertile. Most of the dead, because most of the organisms are dead, the, the microorganisms are dead. Another uh, major breakthrough in association with this, maybe that we are uh, making hue and cry. I'm sure that people should not point their fingers to gene editing. Gene editing, you don't borrow any gene from outside. You make editing process within your uh, system itself. For example, the CRISPR-Cas9 gene technology, uh, clustered regulatory interspersed short palindromic repeat uh, technology in which that you use uh, double-stranded NICs within the system, and then you alter the DNA and then edit the DNA and the, your own DNA is made to either to make a useful uh, enzyme or probably an, a, a useful product, you could make this. This is a revolution. Uh, life systems, at, uh, anything, not, I'm not talking about uh, the plant system, but in all the places, CRISPR-Cas9 technology is big way. Uh, you know, we can, uh, this uh, last year's Nobel Prize went to uh, uh, Emmanuele and Jennifer for their outstanding uh, depiction of in uh, editing, uh, they, they shared this uh, novel praise uh, for, for, for this great uh, discovery. And uh, they say that now uh, the train, the bullet train has already be left the station. Now you cannot stop it. Uh, all those people who have been mudslinging genetic engineering program, you say that you are borrowing a gene from a design matcher. But when you are editing your own gene, why should you bother? Why should you make it? So you have, you can use it for prenatal screening. You can edit uh, the genes and then probably you can uh, correct uh, the uh, genetic defects in the children, uh, in the fetus before it is born. Uh, so uh, strict, of course, uh, when you speak of a uh, uh, management uh, or even if it is anything that is done to the fetus, uh, you need to be extremely a lot of law preventing genetically modified babies. Maybe genetically modified babies, genetically modified babies by through editing. That the correction is already being made through this technology, uh, editing technology and then. Uh, so it has come in a big way. It could be done in sperms and eggs, as well as in embryos, and then uh, the edited product. Uh, so maybe that, uh, like a gene therapy process, Gene therapy uh, could be done much better using this uh, 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 See, uh, it has also you been used uh, very specifically. This is one of those recent uh, uh, findings. Uh, University uh, of Pennsylvania. Uh, what they did was that they have made uh, edited a T cell, a, 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 a blood cell within the body, which creates immune responses, triggers B cells to fight against the invading pathogens. What they did was that they had gone for, uh, you know, making uh, the T cells, these red colored ones are T cells and to see that they are edited to kill the cancer cells. So they have now uh, bound to the cancer cells and then trying to kill it. Uh, Obviously, when you speak of uh, these technologies, people uh, go out of control and things. For example, this man, uh, He Jinaki, uh, what he did was that uh, he took uh, gene editing uh, uh, in uh, the embryo and uh, through which he has developed uh, uh, twin girls uh, and then 
they, he says that these girls are immune to HIV. They will not be able to any time contract HIV. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe it will be a blessing. But then of course, he had, he, his, that their research was stopped because there are a lot of ethics involved in it. Uh, maybe uh, you may do practice things, but then uh, this was not acceptable to people. Probably you didn't take right permission to do it. But then it's a great breakthrough where he had made uh, edited babies uh, who could control or who can never be infected with it. Uh, there are also uh, Switzerland uh, pharmaceutical company, uh, CRISPR therapeutics. Therapeutics has gone for uh, using uh, gene editing for sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia. Uh, these, are, these are all blood related problems and then uh, maybe I do not know how it is this technology is going to come but then uh, if if a baby is born with sickle cell anemia or beta thalassemia we know the kind of uh, problems the baby has uh, cystic fibrosis for that matter baby may live for a few years but then it is a kind of um, troublesome period for the baby to live even if it for two or four years now, again, there is an improvisation that has come in. Uh, normal CRISPR-Cas9 technology makes double-stranded breaks and a chunk of DNA is being altered. Now we have what you call as base editors. Instead of going for a piece of DNA to be edited, you can just go for single point uh, base mutations into the system. So maybe that this again have greater uh, profound usage. Uh, modifying that accelerate single site mutations and that could lead to valuable products. Uh, so there's not, it's more efficient and will not have any uh, problems. Uh, fewer mistakes are being brought in because uh, you also cannot make any com com complaint that it has made. Problems. So base editors, you have normal CRISPR-Cas9 technology, you have now the base editors. Now, uh, again, the uh, latest technology has come in uh, called as prime editing. Prime editing is something different. Uh, you have double standard nick being made over there. Uh, uh, in base editing, you go use the same technology to make the changes in single base uh, bases. And primer editing is something where you have a guide RNA. Uh, See, so you, you look at the guide RNA, which can uh, make a this guide RNA is the one which will make a perfect DNA strand which can be incorporated into one of the strands. So one side, one strand uh, uh, editing is being done. Uh, not just editing, that you make the guide RNA to synthesize uh, the, the corrected DNA and that gets incorporated to the CRISPR uh, protein which can make the link. And so uh, you, have, uh, you have the base editing, uh, the normal CRISPR editing, uh, where you go in for making uh, single uh, point mutations or changes within the system, but our prime editing uh, makes a single strand of a double helix instead of cutting both. The new guide called PEG RNA contains an RNA template for a new DNA sequence to be added to the genome. Now, it has, who can blame this? Everyone has to appreciate it. I'm sure that the kind of mudslinging that you do or uh, what is happening uh, all these years, I'm sure that this would uh, be something which would get uh, uh, clearances from the regulatory agencies. And I'm sure nobody is going to complain uh, that uh, we have done for some natural means. Doing something which has been, I don't say that what uh, the, the Chinese scientist doctor has done by creating a pin uh, through editing, not that. Maybe corrected diseases, you need to have a generation where you do have a baby, when, why do you want to have a sick baby, a, maybe a, a genetically uh, defective baby? I believe, you know, see, maybe they correct it. So you will have generations where you will not have ailments, you will, you will not have, because otherwise, you know that there is no mechanism which you can do. Uh, so uh, with, with you can you can go for uh, all these processes uh, through, uh, it is done, uh, Tumor infiltrating lymphocytes were extracted. This is already uh, wrinkles. Uh, Microscope would provide keep long and healthy life for humans. Again, maybe that uh, we all look for that. Again, another uh, use of, uh, but it was demonstrated in uh, Sinorap, it is elegant. 
probably it would be taken to because it opens up a big things. Uh, no, you know, maybe that longevity can be increased in this process. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe it is demonstrated in xenogram it is again, but uh, it would be uh, the, the basic thing is that now maybe that it is to be translated and tested into human cells and see how it performs. And if it does this, I'm sure that would be longevity. What purpose? I don't know. But longevity uh, will be uh, again. This is uh, something the epigenetic memories. Uh, now we have a big science of epigenetics. My student who is now working at Central University of uh, Kerala, Kasaragod, uh, just uh, has demonstrated that the agrobacterium uh, infection and the genetic transmission done by the agrobacterium is transferred to several generations uh, without the, the, the agrobacterium. Now that means they are epigenetic memories. So epigenetics uh, has come in. Uh, so probably uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, either through CRISPR per se, uh, the base editing, prime editing, or uh, through uh, the epigenetic memories is going to revolutionize the entire understanding. Uh, my, uh, I will uh, just speed up, uh, maybe that I would finish by uh, uh, 4.15. Uh, is it okay, uh, Dr. Shibu? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. That's fine, sir. That's fine, sir. Okay. Okay. I'll just finish this. And this is something very exciting. Stem cell technology yes, and 3D printing. Uh, yes, sir. It will be a loss. Uh, uh, stem cell research is very important. The stem cells can keep dividing indefinitely. Stem cells, you know that you have embryonic stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells, which, which are blood because bone marrow cells, you know, they're all hematopoietic uh, stem cells. Uh, the root of the hair. Uh, the root of the nail, all contain stem cells. It's a wonderful process. Instead of going for uh, chemical-based treatments, you can go for cellular therapy, uh, stem cell-based therapy. You could correct anything that you want. Probably you could do wonders by creating your own organs, new organs uh, against the faulty organs. So this is a big science that is coming up, uh, stem cell research. Uh, see, uh, bearing with what they call as tissue engineering and regenerating. Uh, you know, uh, you, as I said, what you need is that you can convert a stem cells which have got the capacity uh, to differentiate into any number of cells, any kind of cells, provided you give the right. One. So you need to have a, a stem cell uh, which has, which have not totipotent cells. Understand that. A blood cell, a stem cell is not a totipotent cell. The root of the hair, uh, the stem cell is not totipotent. But then you can make them become pluripotent. You can make them develop into certain ways. What you need is that you need to have a place for the cell to grow, the stem cell to grow, and then add the right growth factors. So if you go for adding renal growth factors, it will develop into uh, uh, kidney cells. If it uh, will give it to um, uh, heart cells, uh, growth factors, uh, cardiac growth factors, then it would lead to pulsating cardiac cells, uh, or maybe to the liver, uh, to the lungs, wherever it is, you can make it into any num any kind of cells. And it is going to revolutionize the treatment regimes in different parts of the world. People have already started practicing it, uh, stem cell therapy or stem cell in under regenerative processes. Uh, to classically uh, say about this, you know, this is something uh, which which uh, uh, you should look into. Uh, see, for example, uh, in normal regenerative medicine purposes, you need to have a scaffold. A scaffold uh, which can which is shaped up. A scaffold is a medium, an inert medium, biodegradable. What is done is that see, for example, you can organize it into a structure like this. Okay, into which what you need to do is to add the stem cells. Okay, and then the correct growth factors. So once you do that, probably you can put this scaffold into your body and put the stem cells and the growth factors, they will grow onto the scaffold, shape into the structure of a scaffold, like a scaffold. Probably if it is shaped like a kidney, it would grow into a kidney, have all those glomerules and all those needed uh, for kidney development. As well, uh, what is needed is that you need to add up the right uh, what do you think it is going to create wonders? 
I'm just coming to that. Just imagine, now what happens when you have a fracture? Uh, a fracture, what you do is that you go for uh, normally putting, inserting steel rods. If you have, not for fracture, if you lose a board, piece of board through a severe accident, you put a uh, steel rod and screw it up. And every uh, two years you have to take out it because uh, the, the, the steel does not grow with your board. So it's a big thing. You, you leave it the steel within the board. So why don't you go in for regenerative process where you use a scaffold, uh, uh, like, you know, a scaffold, like, okay, a, a scaffold, it's a, it's a, it could be any uh, bio uh, materials. It could be bioplastics. It could be, uh, you know, any kind of compatible material which can reside within the body. So what you do is that if you have a broken uh, uh, bond and you shape this uh, scaffold, into a bone-like structure, add your uh, cells and the osteoblastic uh, growth factors. Within no time, they say that within about two to three months, you will have a complete bone being regenerated. Science is alarmed. Stem cell technology is going to revolutionize. So probably you can do away with all implant, steel implants uh, during this process. Uh, so, uh, you know, and then you also have uh, this process, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can, uh, you, you, you do that and you can go for uh, a human body. Surgery is a traumatic process. Isn't it? You cannot precisely cut something. You may cut something else too. Only the surgeon knows what from your body is being cut. So maybe that if you have, the surgeon is very sure of a precise surgical procedure, he will have uh, real-time MRIs and CT scans that you scan the whole body, see the organ, perform with minimal damage to the other things. And it's going to be uh, a 3D-based uh, uh, you know, uh, viewing of the human body. Uh, and it is going to be a big boon to the surgical procedures so that you will not have any problem. 3D bioprinting is something which is very important and try please, uh, this, this, you know, it's, it uses a 3D printer. Uh, a 3D printer like the inkjet printer. Now you have a 3D bioprinter and 3D printers. Buildings are being printed, you know, like huge uh, printers, 3D printers, buildings at nick of the time. You need to specifically uh, make a computer uh, stimulation of the whole thing and then a whole structure can be built. multi story building that are being built by huge uh, printers, 3D printers. Bi Bioprinters are not that um, uh, you could go in for uh, 3D printed organs, uh, have been used for centuries. Of course, uh, you would do away with artificial limbs. Uh, 3D printing and taken made to uh, heart, kidney, and liver. Uh, and this is something. So uh, it has become a classic biodegradable scaffold. You don't have to go use this. This is that one. 3D printing. Uh, the earlier uh, regenerative process, as I said, you need to have a scaffold which is region which which gets uh, absorbed, uh, degraded by the body uh, at the course of time. But this does not require that. So you will have uh, you have a 3D printer. Uh, so uh, bi bi generating replacements, for example, this is a 3D bioprinter. All these things are printed onto the petri plate, which can be grown. It could be a bigger one. And uh, the whole thing probably it could be a kidney, it could be a ear, it could be a, you know a lost ear, or or maybe any organ within the body can be 3D. Advantage is that the, it it gives uh, uh, you know uh, shape up. What you need is that you are using stem cells to do that. Use the correct uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the growth factor. Then you will have uh, without a scaffold you can do. This is just a classical example of uh, somebody has lost an ear. Uh, and uh, you are medical imaging, uh, you know, CT, MRI, then uh, three CAD model, visualization motion program, 3D printing process, especially like making, organizing cells into the shape of an ear, and then uh, the 3D uh, printed one. And imagine this is what it is. You could make this is uh, near uh, growing a 3D printed. It's not. A, a, a computer stimulation. This is what actually has happened. Uh, probably, uh, and this this could be planted. Uh, you know, it could be an ear now, uh, but it could be anything else. See, for example, see this. 
this is this is an air ear uh, grown under the skin this this lady the soldier she she survived a fatal uh, car crash she lost one of her ears what they did was that they have taken uh, the, the cartilage uh, from the bone and then they put the through steam uh, printed it uh, 3d printed it and then put it under the skin and after some day the doctors have taken that and it was replanted <laughs> so maybe that is a reason that real regeneration that you have you don't have to live without your hands you don't have to live without your legs you could even go for making uh, your own process um, so, many lungs, you know, all those things. Now, now things have gone uh, in a great way that you would be uh, able to make it uh, anything that you want. Uh, so, uh, maybe that you could uh, modify, uh, you know, and an offshoot of this is the three parent technique, you know, which you know, it may be born uh, with the involvement of three parents. See, like that, a lady had a uh, Worst disease called as uh, Lay syndrome. This uh, disease does not make her to have a baby. You know, uh, baby uh, dies because this is a uh, maternal mitochondrial called it uh, default. And then uh, every time, uh, unless you have, because you know that the egg is having the, the mitochondria, and you know that uh, the mitochondrial character is always maternal and not maternal. So what was done in this process is that you have you have taken the mother's egg, mother's egg, put it into the uh, mother's egg is being put into the cytoplasm of a dog, which has got normal, but this mitochondria are faulty and this mitochondria are functional. So transplant this into uh, this and then uh, you know uh, fertilize it with the sperm of the father. So you have a nuclear donor, the mother, herself, the cytoplasmic donor, a, a donor uh, who is uh, another person, and your uh, husband's sperm being reposed. So you have one, two, three, three parents for this baby. But the alarming thing is that the baby born, which you saw, uh, on her lap is the one uh, which does not have this disease. And this lucky lady through this technology could have this baby with all uh, uh, solving all the problems. All it is uh, a mitochondrial mother, uh, a nuclear mother, and a, a, a what you call as a biological father. So maybe uh, the science has gone to that level. And not only that, it, it, has, it has come to this level where you have you use artificial intelligence and uh, say you have created uh, life. Uh, I wouldn't uh, go into the details of it, but then imagine this man uh, who started Celera Genomics, uh, wherein uh, you all fruits of uh, genomics is mainly because of this uh, uh, person who was associated with the National Institute of Health, finally changed, uh, jumped out of that and started his own company. And this man has made a bacteria. Uh, a semi-synthetic bacteria, where he has synthesized the entire genetic material, and the entire genetic material was synthesized and inserted into uh, a, a mycoplasma microbes bacterium, and this has started dividing, and the whole sort of you know progenies have been made. So with that, I'm sure you would be able to go for creating uh, organisms at your will. Human beings can be created. Uh, this is that. Uh, uh, mycoplasma mycoids dividing, establishing the colonies, uh, which relies on the synthetic DNA. So, um, a lot much of things happening around the world. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to this now. Bionic uh, men's uh, men um, have the organisms can be uh, created, uh, not just robotics. Robotic and artificial intelligence you can create. But you will be able to go for creating a, a humanoid, a near human being, like this is a, a bionic man or what you call as a humanoid uh, with all uh, functional uh, characteristics. Limbs, uh, you know, being created through flesh and blood. Uh, everything could be created.
course, this this you would think that this is a science fiction, but I'm sure that in the course of time, this is going to come into a reality where you will have robots, uh, you know, uh, near to the human being, what you call as humanoids, and what the Lord knows whether uh, the powerful scientists will be creating uh, humans using the synthetic uh, DNA technology, uh, the stem cell technology, the 3D printing technology, put all these things combined together. I am sure that definitely an organism, a human being, or any other human organism can be created, provided the law, law permits, of course. Biotechnology is not for that. We don't want that. Biotechnology is for using uh, the biological organism, biological processes for the human being. Unless we have something to be done. So my uh, final uh, plea to my listeners uh, would be that biotechnology, take it very seriously. It is a science which can serve the society, which can reach the society, which can bring in a lot much of impact onto the society, either by a, through a process or maybe the correcting the genetic diseases, it reaches this. And like the vaccine which you have seen, the diagnostic process, the RT-PCR technology, it's all contributions. I'm sure that if man has to go in for uh, the problems are going to come in. I'm sure that now it is Corona. You had Nipah, you had uh, SARS, you had MERS, you have Nipah, uh, you have uh, COVID-19, and then probably some other virus is going to come. Some other organism is going to come. It again will become a pandemic. And unless you are a either to go for making medicines, making medicine, for example, with COVID-19, you don't have any medicine. You cannot do like what you make a vaccine. Vaccine is not, but you take a chemical drug, a drug being that creates a lot of harm. So you won't get a, 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 a easy legal uh, sanction uh, for that process. So we don't have, we have been using, repurposing the drug, Remdesivir, uh, the, the one which is used for general class of virus, or maybe that uh, several other uh, drugs being used, which are being repurposed. No medicine has been has been created. Dengue people have started creating uh, uh, medicines and especially using uh, the indigenous technology. People have done. So my dear um, students, uh, biotechnology, please take biotechnology seriously. If you are a biotechnology student, try to get deeper into it and try to do things by which it reaches the society. You could become an entrepreneur by yourself. You can have your startups, I'm sure, or until Kerala State Council for Science Technology, the Biotechnology Commission, which I was associated, uh, the, the uh, Science Engineering Research Board, where still I am associated, number of programs, Iraq, where uh, I have connections. Uh, all these agencies are there to support you uh, to come out with something, just not for, of course, there are funds available for carry, carrying out your basic biotechnology research. But what I say is that the one which is translated into a product or a process. I'm sure the biotechnologists are going to be the saviors. Uh, maybe that medical biotechnologies or uh, the basic biotechnologies or uh, maybe the genome scientists together, if they put you know, work together. In that matter, what is needed is that the interdisciplinary interactive platform where you need to accommodate all the people together. Interdisciplinary interactive research only lab. I'm sure you will think about this and going for it. Don't shy away if you have to discuss with somebody for getting your uh, uh, problem solved. Together work. Uh, when you work together, I'm sure there, there are a lot of things. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shibu, for uh, giving me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts. I would have gone for a technical lecture on microRNA or any other thing, uh, but I'm sure that uh, it wouldn't go this way. But I have taken a lot of pains to gather this much of information. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure, sure that they are, they are the latest available. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I love uh, MacFast and I hope this institution grows to greater height. And especially when uh, people like uh, Dr. Uh, you know, uh, Shibu has joined uh, that place. She all the best. Wish okay, the students you, all sir. the best. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, sir. thank you very much. Thank I'm you, sir. ready to take questions if there is time. Sure, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for the knowledgeable session. We look forward in future also for such sessions from you. Uh, uh, the session is open for discussion. Uh, I request all the participants to please uh, put in your uh, questions.
So meanwhile, I have a question for you, sir. What actually are the limitations of 3D bioprinting? Uh, as for today, uh, the only thing is that uh, you need to have either, you know, see, there is nothing which can replace a womb, isn't it? A uterus, uh, there is no specific uh, structure being made which can, uh, you know, a women's womb is said to be the one which cannot be replicated. So otherwise, you have bioreactors where you can grow all these organs, you know. Uh, so maybe that unless you understand, you see, for example, why is it that the animal cells are not expressing their total potential? You know, you are not giving the right conditions to make the genes to be right. So one of those uh, difficulties that you, you may be able to go in for making organs, may, creating organs through 3D bioprinting, uh, maybe that you can create any organs, but I don't think that it would go to the whole organism. And probably in that case, I'm sure that you're becoming a uh, god uh, yourself. You know, so that won't happen. But what the major problem is that you need to have the right place to grow your one. That's why that ear was grown under the skin, you know, so within the body itself. So you need to have, so maybe that you need to have a place within your, uh, you know, if you have a faulty kidney, maybe si alongside your kidney, you can grow a, a kidney. Maybe that uh, your damaged liver, you know, can be grown. Though, though it has got regeneration, but the acute liver cirrhosis, you need to have replacement and liver transplantation probably. Now this would come in. So maybe that let us look into that. Reprint, 3D print a portion of the liver uh, with the stem cell technology and then uh, replant into your body so that alongside your uh, normal liver, it will reach to grow into a full fledged. So maybe that the hole in the heart can be, you know, control. So anything could be done, but then there are limitations. Don't think that, you know, like what I said about bionic man. Bionic man still needs the inside uh, steel st structures and things, but only thing is that surface, it looks like you know, with all the skin and other kind of things. So there is, there is a limitation for everything. Uh, it's not that, uh, and, and I'm sure that's what I said, that you become a god, a creator of yourself if you go in for that. So there are a lot of limitations, but then there are wonders waiting for you. Uh, nobody will be uh, waiting for a kidney transplant because you don't get the right donor. You you, you have no right donor for a, a liver or acute liver cirrhosis program. And all these are going to be addressed in the course of time. So that's what uh, I feel. The limitations are this. Otherwise, it is, it, it is, it's a, it's a, it's a great treasure that is available with us. Uh, a great avenue that is available with us, which could be taken. Okay. Okay. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I think Dr. Sibu has a question for you, sir. Dr. Sibu? Yeah. Uh, sir, it was very nice to talk. You know, it was very refreshing, very refreshing. Uh, so our last talk was uh, actually on CRISPR. And we were discussing actually, so uh, United States, they are quite open to the technology. But uh, US, uh, I mean, Europe has a uh, very cold uh, approach to CRISPR. Uh, of course, for basic science, they are ready to do um, CRISPR, but uh, for applied uh, uh, research, you know, they are not that open for uh, CRISPR technology to adopt. Uh, what is our response, our country's response to CRISPR or uh, GMO or technology? Sir? GMO what? is totally uh, out of uh, question because yeah. we have uh, the strict regulations. Uh, mm -hmm. the, maybe that the restrictions would ease once you come with, uh, you know, CRISPR-Cas9 technology, mm -hmm. it hasn't become much popular in the country. Yeah, 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 like okay. people who, like people come from abroad, like you, and people who come from abroad, probably will practice something. But with the constraints of the conditions available in India, I'm sure that you will not be able to go in for practice. Mm -hmm. uh, open science, you know, see, science should be open. Let yeah. it, maybe that it's only when you do something damage to the society, then only you should be concerned. Mm -hmm. So anything mm -hmm. good being done. So CRISPR-Cas9 provided that there are, where are the valuable findings in the country? We don't have. Like yeah. what uh, what Deepak Pentel has done with his brinjal, mm -hmm. with his uh, mustard, or maybe that um, companies coming out with the BT brinjal, BT uh, um, cotton and all those. Uh, if, I'm sure if you take up CRISPR-Cas9 technology, gene editing for making an organism with high productivity, nutrient content, 
as well as disease resistance capability. I'm sure that the crop, they, they cannot de give, uh, deny giving you a permission to take okay. it to the okay. Okay. So, so maybe it's usually, that... Yeah, it's usually crop-wise we have to take permission. So if you select a crop, yeah, we have to demonstrate them that this is a, so this is a highly not really high that. crop. Not, yeah. No, 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 that is not. That mm -hmm. obviously is being done. What is important yeah. is that it doesn't do harm to the uh, ah, yeah, you know, society, diversity. Yeah. So yeah, what sure. uh, the hue and cry is that you have uh, the Genetic uh, Engineering Appraisal Committee, mm -hmm. GEAC, controlled by uh, the Ministry of Environment and Forest, uh, the, the, the Biosafety Committee, controlled by the Department of Biotechnology. All these would be, there are number of experts in the committees uh, uh, the scientific community will grant it, but you know the, the NGOs looking, sitting there to mudsling yeah, on yeah. So you yeah, won't yeah, be sure. able to please them to do that. But mm -hmm. CRISPR Cas9, I'm sure, uh, provided you demonstrate a feasible program uh, in any of the things that which I have said, uh, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Legislation okay, is very strict. Indian conditions to get through something uh, is, is very. Difficult. Okay. But Pendel, I tell you that what is the role, what is wrong in this technology? Just to make a, a crossbreeding process, he has developed that technology, but it has not surfaced. Mm -hmm. It is still uh, in his laboratory. People are making a lot of uh, hue and cry uh, about that. I don't know. Even uh, BT binjol, uh, they, what is the problem? Binjol is not eaten raw, is it? It is cooked. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. no protein, no DNA will remain because in that case you are eating a lot of proteins and, and DNA, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I don't think. I think yeah. uh, maybe that's a whole constraint. Probably mm -hmm. maybe another uh, three five years. Especially I said the paradigm shift happening in biotechnology research where yeah. things should reach the society and probably people will realize. Yeah. Anyway, good to see that the top academicians like you are uh, quite open and supportive for this kind of new technology. Yeah, That's very we nice. are. We are. In the yeah, committees, yeah. when we sit, we always say. But the yeah, yeah. only thing is that being a scientist, I cannot take that kind of pressure, you know, uh, from an NGO person who can speak anything. I have, I have to control myself. I have to be a disciplined <laughs> defender while an NGO yeah, person yeah. can speak anything. They can abuse me. Mm -hmm. yeah. They can uh, score sure, yes, me. True. True. Yeah, that is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Anything else? Please use this opportunity because you won't get such dignitaries to ask questions directly. Of course. I'm putting <laughs> my uh, email ID. <laughs> I'm an open person. <laughs> yes. I would always sir, love to. Uh, sir, we have a question for you from Deepthi uh, Rish Kumar. Uh, uh, sir, she asked that will the transgene transfer to human or animal when they consume it? I didn't get it. Will the transgene transfer to human or animals when they consume it? No, 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 no. How can tra tra transgene is the one which is introduced into the genome? You know, the genetic ex that's what the question is, isn't it? When you consume it. Yes, yes, it, yes, it, it, yes. No, it cannot. It, in that case, I'm sure that man would have been, or uh, any other organism would have been the most modified organism available. You eat a lot of DNA, isn't it? Uh, from any source, you are you are voracious eater. So all those DNA coming in, if it gets incorporated into your body, the only thing is that your proteins uh, in contained in your food can cause food allergy. Other kinds of problems, but no DNA uh, can withstand, can go get, get and get incorporated unless you have a vector. Virus is a notorious vector. Virus, if you eat virus, maybe that virus will evade all the immune responses and go and introduce it. So on its own, DNA has not. Uh, for example, only the viruses which carry uh, uh, the, the required enzymes, uh, transposable elements, you know, for that matter. You know, it can get into the, the elements are this that happens normally in the body. But otherwise, no segment of DNA. If you eat it, I'm sure that it will uh, get uh, yeah, you will get uh, nutrition. Uh, is it okay? Is it okay? Did I answer that? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So uh, there is one more question from yeah from Prajita, I think so, sir. Uh, she asked. So just a second. 
Sir, can we consider this pandemic COVID-19 as an effect of biotechnology? <laughs> Absolutely not. You know, you say so many things. Uh, probably it's a biological warfare in China. You know, I don't think that any sane person at this uh, point of time would go in for uh, China, uh, lakhs of people have been uh, killed through the pandemic, isn't it? So you don't make, <laughs> kill yourself uh, to kill somebody uh, outside uh, your country. I don't think so. I don't think that it's an escape. It is a variant of SARS uh, virus, MERS virus. That's why it's called as SARS-CoV-2. It's a SARS virus with little mutation. And now the variants which are available. So all these probably, uh, you know, I don't think that, please don't take it uh, that way. Don't have any negative impact on biotechnology. Biotechnology is not to harm people. Uh, it is the savior uh, uh, of humankind. And all those things a, a true biotechnologist would do. Typically, you are bonded to, to do things which are clearly ethical. Unethical things, you can do it, isn't it? Unethical, probably somebody will create uh, uh, biological warfare and do all those. There are movies where uh, you know that. But I don't think that any country would be doing that because uh, a nuclear weapon, you can target it and send it, but a virus. It comes to you as well as to others. So you need to be very, very, how do you shield yourself from a virus if it is biotechnology creation? You cannot, you have no method. Maybe that masking or maybe sanitization, all these things could help you. But somehow you are going to get it. Some of the population, I don't think, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't accept it. I will never accept it. Unless there are solid proof, you know, because you can be, <laughs> you can have to change your opinion. Clear? Oh, yes, sir. So another question from Sumera Rafi. So should we ha have very strong background in molecular biology for doing advanced research in biotechnology? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, you cannot just get out uh, everything outsourced. Uh, you need to have, you need to know how a PCR reaction is done. How exactly you open up the DNA uh, and uh, go for inserting your gene, whether it's using a vector uh, or maybe any of those physical uh, methods to insert a DNA, uh, and then evaluating it. All this needs a strong molecular biology back. Biotechnology, uh, the strong component of biotechnology is molecular. So you need to have a clear understanding. All the techniques in molecular. If you want to become a successful biotechnologist, then you need to have that. There's no compromise on that. Okay. So and I tell you, my, my, my institution is open. My center is open to yeah. all of you. Yeah. MacFast could definitely make use of my facility. You name it. All high-end equipment uh, are housed here with qualified technicians who can not only do the work, but also it. I'm not doing a business. It's a university system. So I did not. But I say uh, that. And the advantage I give is that I make all the people to be physically present when the work is done. I don't think that you get yes. it. You don't know. You don't want thank to. You, sir. Thank, yeah. thank, thank you, sir. I hope thank so, you, sir. We so will definitely students. make use of that, sir. Yes, uh, students. Yes. And, and definitely, sir, we have participants from almost uh, every part of Kerala and even in neighboring state. I hope so. They'll uh, make use thank of this session. My center, yeah. Genomic Center, Inter yeah. University Center for Genomics and Gene Technology. Uh, you are, it's also again a facilitation center. Yes. Over there, there are four uh, qualified research associates working every time uh, and technicians, and then you can make use of all genome based technologies. So connect it with the uh, Inter University Center to that of Cliff. I'm sure that you can do all this and have your project set. Meaning. Uh, so there is one more question from Alfonso Thomas. Uh, what are the problems related to 3D printing affected our body? Uh, you know, you, you normally print something, grow it in vitro and transplant it to it. And what is that uh, bad thing happening to you? Nothing, because it is your own stem cells. Your own stem cells being 3D printed and only thing is that the 3D printing is used to shape up the organ. See, for example, you want to make a kitty. It has to be shaped up. Into, instead of using a scaffold, you are making a 3D printer to make a kitty. Okay. And for that matter, you have no incompatibility. 
tissue incompatibility because it's your own uh, stem cells. So I don't think that if you go in for a real 3D printing process, there is no harm because the body will not reject it. And everything, when it is shaped into a conducive environment, it goes for producing the exact structure as that what is happening uh, in the case of uh, heart cells. If you make a stem cell to become a heart cell, it would be pulsating, even in, in isolation. That is the power of the growth factor that is that you add. So it is only uh, the neuron stem cells with the growth factor shaped up into an organ being transplanted in your body. So I don't think that will happen. There, there will be any kind of problem. I don't think so. Nothing. Thank but you, sir. Because it's not that easy <laughs> to print it and then grow it and then make it mature to be transplanted in the body is is, is little uh, you know troublesome process. Otherwise, but you can do it with the kind of technology that you have. You will definitely be. And as I said, that the 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 real time MRI uh, technology where you can visualize the entire body can take this exactly uh, and put it in. Your kidney transplant becomes very, because now kidney plant, transplantation or heart transplantation, it depends on the surgeon, the efficiency of the surgeon, the preciseness of the surgeon. But in this case, it is surgeon may not be that important because everything is done, controlled by the machines. But 3D printing, Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Smida. Uh, she asked that, uh, as you mentioned about transparent nematode, which can be used to treat wrinkles and skin, is it by the regulation of NPR8? Is that wrinkles, controlled wrinkles, you know, yeah. uh, you know that's a kind of uh, laboratory demonstration that could be controlled in a, in a, in a uh, worm, you know, and you know, see, you always do with Drosophila, you always will do with many other test organisms, and then finally come to human beings. It's a long way to go. Maybe what I'm saying is that uh, longevity, increasing the longevity, uh, maintaining, you know, all those shape of uh, your face, face and other places, uh, probably that will help it. I do not know how far it would be. Uh, this is being done. This this is being practiced in Sinorabiti elegance and probably uh, the technology can be perfected in the course of time on a cell system, the uh, animal system, and then. Thank you, sir. So there's a question from uh, Stalin. Uh, he wants to know whether stem cell technology could bring brain dead patients back to yes. life. Yes, yes, yes. Now, neuronal regeneration, especially not for brain death, see, uh, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, uh, then uh, Parkinson's, where it's all neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, neurodegenerative diseases are now are treated using stem cell technology. So you could make the nerve growth factors, if you add, any stem cell can be converted. To nerve. So replenishing the nerve cells, uh, the neurons, uh, with the stem cell technology, I'm sure that you will have Parkinson's. And a brain death person, I do not know, you need to, because the person has to remain and you need to have enough time to create a brain of its own. That way. But Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, all neuro-degenerative diseases can be controlled. And one of those uh, effective use of stem cell technology is true for neurogenesis. Probably in the course of time, the trauma, uh, you know, maybe brain dead persons, maybe that you can uh, create the whole brain. I don't know whether to create whole brain uh, would be possible, but a part of the brain can be done. Uh, nerve cells can be, uh, neuronal cells can be regenerated. In the course of time, probably that would be a solution. At least a part of the brain can be revived. Uh, some of those functions, for example, a brain dead person, that nothing happens. So maybe that you stimulate make uh, this to regenerate, to develop a part of the brain, probably some of the functions can be done. I don't know how far it is going to be. But neurodegenerative diseases, definitely stem cell technology. Uh, so there's another question. Uh, what are the major things uh, that we should keep in mind while going from for a startup in biotechnology? The question is from Dr. Rena Anthony. Uh, a startup, uh, yeah. either, uh, uh, yeah, uh, a startup 
is a venture uh, that you uh, start. It's it's a pre-industrial program, isn't it? You have uh, startup centers, for example. You have uh, a startup uh, facility uh, in Sri Chitra, where to to make it, you get get the infrastructure and everything, but you need to have a novel idea. Novel idea alone cannot become a startup. You need to translate that idea into a process of a product. So one thing is that you need to shape a product through the biotechnology, anything, anything, it could be anything. It may be, you don't go for a very, very high profile things, but a very simple thing being created. And once you have the know-how, you can get into a startup. Startup and an incubation facility is where you specifically make something to be started, to expand into a big industry. So support will come to you. Industry means that you have big loans coming in. Startup uh, assistance, you have a uh, Kerala startup mission uh, where biotech, they have not come to the biotech, but all uh, software related startups there. So you need to have a product generated by you on your own, or maybe that you can borrow something. See, for example, a patented technology. You can, if you understand that this patented, patented, patented technology has some value and it can be developed. So for example, somebody has developed a, a, a vaccine. Somebody has developed a drug. It has come to that stage where you want to make it, you borrow that and then going forward, making into a, a, a facility which is just the beginning of a big industry. Kiran Mazumdar has started like a startup. And most of those agencies have started. I know many companies in uh, the Masvalitan Center for, uh, you know, what do you call us? Bionics. Uh, no, sorry, it's not Bionics. Uh, I don't remember what this name. Uh, you have one in Kalamichet, uh, the Bionics, uh, supported by uh, Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotech. All these are nurturing startup ventures. Uh, Bayrak, Bayrak from uh, a, 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 an agency of biotechnology, Department of Biotechnology, supports all the things. But the only thing is that you need to have a specific proof of concept that you have developed something because nobody will try to help you unless you get your uh, product process vetted, foolproof, and then going for that. Otherwise, because risk is too much. And especially in biological system, risk is too much. So maybe that you should ensure. That's why normally startups will not give you much of uh, uh, burdens. You know, because people, once you are failure, uh, the amount that you get as a support from agencies uh, they would, uh, would not tax you because you have, but once you become uh, flourish yourself, that's why high risk, high reward programs are there. High risk, high reward program. It is a program done by uh, Department of Science and Technology as well. As, you know, risk is involved. You know, there are a lot of risk involved. But then uh, uh, once you succeed, it's a great reward company. People who, is sponsor, who are sponsoring you will also understand that there is high risk in it. So when they support you with funds, they don't ask you to give the money back. That's why high risk, high reward programs are there. There's a number of programs out there. You would get into the SCRB website or uh, the, the DST website. And for facilitation, you can look into what is happening in Sri Chitra or the Bionis program at, uh, ah, it is Time Out, Time Out at Valiathan uh, uh, Center at Sri Chitra, where there are four or five, uh, in, including one supported by us, uh, Kerala Biotechnology Commission has won it in Okay, And it is coming up. So uh, the only thing is that unlike unlike the software startups, uh, the biological startups are little risky. You need to ensure that you have something available. So maybe that you can go for something which normally is very easy to demonstrate uh, and don't take any uh, bigger things immediately. So jump into that. Once you streamline yourself and stabilize yourself, but then the only thing is that you need to have perseverance, you need to have determination, uh, and you should always be uh, accepting challenges. So if you have that kind of qualities, I'm sure that's startup is. So in that case, you can definitely start your own 
business owners. And people should come forward. Then only industries are going to come in Kerala, in India. Nobody, a scientist is in the comfort zone of his laboratory for publications and patents. That's what I said, isn't it? What else you need? You need to have publications, you get a career advancement. You get a placement elsewhere. You don't bother whether you need But there are people who would sacrifice their job and get into that startup ventures and to have become big entrepreneurs. Dr. Reddy, for that matter, Reddy's laboratories. There are some teen examples. Uh, just, just classical examples, of course, it is uh, uh, the Apple. Steve Jobs, you know, started as a startup. Apple was started in his garage uh, with very simple uh, funding. But from there, he has grown into it. Provided you have the right vision, right determination. Okay. So startups, maybe that you can uh, contact many of these agencies. Uh, but only thing is that identify a process or a product. This can be taken to an industry. Uh, you, you have agencies where this will be tested. Your product will be tested for its marketing efficiency, its, its uh, quality control mechanisms, everything. So any biotech parks will have all the facilities. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, there's a question from Anjana. Can you please explain the lifespan of artificial organs? What is that artificial organ? Uh, she might I be. Not, I, I did not say about any artificial organs. It is all, uh, you know, uh, biological uh, organs only. I she might be dealing, uh, telling in, in accordance with 3D printing, sir. It is not artificial. How can it be artificial? It's a stem cell, which has grown and shaped it into a bio organ. Isn't it? It's not artificial. An artificial limb is an artificial structure, isn't it? An artificial hand, or maybe something being added. A pacemaker is an artificial structure. But a, 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 a pulsating uh, part of the heart being regenerated, or a heart as a whole, is, it is the same biological system. There's nothing artificial. So artificial would be, uh, I don't think that it's not compatible with, you know, the, the, the steel rods being implanted, <laughs> artificial uh, things being implanted, they remain as steel rods, you know, nothing happens. So uh, I, I, I've dealt with all biological systems. And uh, even what I said is that the bionic uh, limbs and all those things, are, they're all uh, humanoids. They are not human beings, humanoids. Something which are comparable. Uh, artificial intelligence, coupled with the stem cell technology and the, the uh, robotics. You know, see these three, artificial intelligence, robotic methodology, and the stem cell technology put together as made biotech. So imagine that, robotics is needed, but that would be called as a, an artificial system. The bionic man, probably a chimeric artificial system, but I don't think. Any of those things, 3D printed structures are artificial, okay? okay. Yes, sir. sir. There are a couple more questions, sir. If it's no okay. problem. No problem. That is really fine. Okay, I don't sir. mind. Okay, sir. There's a question from Stacy. Uh, what the time range is required for the generation of an organ through 3D printing? Time range. Uh, 3D printing is where, uh, you know, you are putting the stem cells in position. Okay. Now, when you add the growth factors, it takes its own time to regenerate into a structure. For example, if you 3D print a, 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 a kidney, man, that's only cells being placed. The structures are to be developed. So that's why I said it should be grown in a conducive place. So it needs probably, uh, for example, a kidney. Uh, how much time it takes for a fetus to develop the whole thing? You know, the same way you are making a component of fetus to be developed. So if you can make, uh, you know, people will not allow uh, your, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> part of your body to be grown. So what I say is that, uh, you know, it might, uh, it's a biological system. You cannot make it fast. You cannot have a baby born uh, uh, two months or three months time. It makes full nine months. Otherwise, it will be a premature baby. So likewise that you need to specifically identify, for example, a kidney, it should develop the entire structure 
the uh, angiogenesis should happen, the glomerulus, the filtering units should develop. And since because you have the right um, uh, growth factors and the right thing, people have made uh, things like that. That's what the success of the world. So 3D printing is to shape up. You avoid scaffolds. Okay. Uh, you shape up into uh, a, a kidney structure, and there are all that those are only cells. Put it into a conducive medium uh, where you add the growth factors and all the other necessary building blocks that would develop into a structure. Okay. It would take it, uh, take uh, maybe uh, six to seven months to have a complete thing. Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, there is another question from R. R. Usha Sri. Uh, she has appreciated your talk and she wants to ask that which field has more scope for biotechnologies, plant <laughs> or animal biotechnology? <laughs> plant uh, means that you would be able to translate it very fast. Okay. But the animal system that uh, you won't be able to create a, uh, you know, uh, you know, maybe that uh, uh, plant, creating a new plant becomes easy. Creating a new organism is not that easy. So maybe that uh, you need to take the constraint. Uh, lucrative area would be any field. See, provide it, you know, uh, do what you love or love what you do. You need to do what you love. Many times it becomes impossible for you to do that. Love what you do. So any field is uh, lucrative. Any field can give you dividends, provided you determine yourself. You analyze your capability. You are, uh, you know, uh, have faith in yourself. And then once you have faith in yourself, I'm sure that you will be able to. So what is that? Uh, what is important is that wherever you are, in any area of biotechnology, what I have said, uh, probably just a product being done, a drug being done, uh, or maybe a molecule being done. A, a targeted uh, drug delivery process being developed. All these are lucrative areas. Nanotechnology, nanobiotechnology for that matter. Uh, you know, uh, enc encapsulating your drug into nano uh, composites materials and delivering through ligand receptor technology. The other side could be a very big area, uh, a lucrative area. So only thing is that it all depends on passion. You need to decide what you want to do. And probably in any area that you are, you can excel, provided you put your efforts, uh, put your might, as well as your intelligence. Involvement is very important. People do things passively, and uh, you will never get uh, interest in an area. Choose the area where which you like. Where do you, you have enough of areas available in the Google uh, into biotechnology areas, and then find out what it is. Try to learn about it and then try to develop uh, an interest in that and then try to. So I wouldn't say uh, that uh, this area is good, that area is bad. The only thing is that how much deep you want to go into the area. That's what is important. Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, there's another question on lifespan from Dr. Salim Jose. He asked that, is the lifespan based on source stem cell? If it is from the umbilical cord, lifespan is more. Is, is it like that? Uh, uh, umbilical cord, uh, nobody has tested that. Uh, you are not generating a complete organism that way. You could go for uh, somatic, uh, you know, stem cells, or maybe that, or maybe you could go for embryonic stem cells. Uh, you could also go for uh, the, the embryonic stem cells from uh, the umbilical cord. That's why you say that any time a lady gives a birth to a child, uh, you need to go uh, for a, uh, an association, an understanding uh, between the place where you give uh, birth to a child and uh, to the hospital, saying that your umbilical cord will be preserved there uh, for next five years. No hospital does that, but there is an undertaking there. So you give your umbilical cord, but it's a treasure. It contains number of variable things. Therapeutic purposes you can use, uh, you know, uh, there, there will be many, many, many new drugs can be developed. Uh, but then uh, I do not know because the moment you say a stem cell, uh, you know, uh, this, these stem cells are never, have never undergone differentiation. Once it undergoes differentiation, that is the ultimate. It doesn't come back. Isn't it? So maybe, and, and there is no reprogram. 
umbilical cord cells have, uh, as well other stem cells have. but the only thing is that it is an adult stem cell i mean taken from an adult organism probably i do not know you know like what has happened to dolly you know the 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 gaunt uh, mum uh, you know see it, it died uh, prematurely because the age was prescribed down to the cell uh, which was taken from uh, the, the donor so maybe that there may be i do not know probably people should look into that the organs have not failed uh, after two or three years of time so uh, the, the structures being created have not failed uh, because it is uh, it is taken from uh, such um, you know embryonic or adult stem cells stem cells whether it is a resource we have the technology to make and function like an embryo so maybe that uh, people should try that way but umbilical cord again uh, would be that you can can be used to the child or to the mother only compatibility problem comes in over there isn't it but if it is taken from your body that's why people prefer to have your own stem cells either from your bone marrow or maybe from uh, any part of your body that you take your stem cells and grow that is highly compatible to you umbilical cord has got wider uses it could become a uh, you know a plethora of applications can be there drug development uh, you know uh, even drug testing all this could be very important and also it could be valuable to the to you also to the child that is born from but i don't think that any, we, we have no repositories they say that uh, it, 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 there is a uh, issue that what you call as biobanks biobanks you know that they should store this for five years it's a mandatory requirement and when they take the umbilical cord but then what happens is that the umbilical cord goes elsewhere or they throw it <laughs> so maybe i do not know the age i will not be able to say uh, and to, nobody will be able to predict that unless you uh, make it that way okay so there is another interesting question and probably a question that is popping up in in everyone's mind is there any career opportunity in your biology center sir so that students can enter <laughs> <laughs> see uh, virology uh, of course uh, you need to you know that it's a dedicated uh, institution okay. uh, virology if you have basic qualification in virology uh, and probably uh, if you know there could be two way you are a virologist walk into the institute and start you are a biotechnologist or a biochemist or uh, any other scientist you can be hired and then you will be trained to do that is as you know that most of those virology experiments should be done in extreme uh, sterile conditions biosafety conditions so there is nothing wrong you see we have uh, in the virology department we have viro we need virologists we need biochemists we need biotechnologists uh, we need uh, entomologists you know because dengue <laughs> and uh, uh, dengue uh, all those uh, uh, you know uh, viruses which are vector borne uh, need to be studied for example i didn't know uh, mosquito control the mosquito i i had uh, something to speak about uh, the, the genetically modified uh, mosquitoes you know you need to have molecular biologists over there for that you need to have wolbachia it's a bacterium and rich endo uh, endophyte being implanted into uh, this thing so you need to have a number of group only thing is that you know maybe uh, if you if you shape your your capabilities in line with that so you need to going for uh, virology courses uh, you need to going for maybe that you have got of opportunity you go for diagnostic courses so uh, it's not that for everything that virology specialized people are being taken number of opportunities so you have uh, several disciplines divisions in the center but all of a sudden they will not go for appointing people so you could uh, join that place uh, on an apprentice level uh, or as a, as a contract staff learn things and then finally mature uh, to get but then the institute is for a cause so it addresses the virus related problems in the state of kerala to the country and it has got international place 
Oh, uh, that's an improvement. You, all of you, all of you are competent to get into that. I will not recommend, but <laughs> I'm sure that it's open place. It is open place, and uh, maybe you get equipped yourself to work on viruses. Uh, any aspect of viruses, molecular biology, you know, a stem cell technology, or anything that is. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, we have one last question. Is there any chance to occur diseases in 3D printing of organs? Everyone is interested in 3D printing, sir. <laughs> there is any chance to occur diseases? So... No, I don't think. I don't think. Uh, disease uh, cannot be because you're taking stem cells. Uh, relatively, stem cells are free of diseases. Because it's only in a differentiated cell that you have problems. So uh, I don't think that any 3D printed structures will have problems. Maybe that I would uh, request you to make a visit to Srichitra. They have a 3D printing yes. facility over there and uh, you can contact Dr. Uh, Mohan uh, of Srichitra uh, and obviously he will be able to. But I don't think that you know you are, you are not, you are doing away with disease. So you don't want to create an organ with a uh, difficulty or uh, abnormality. You would never do that. Okay? Create very uh, specific and sound structures. That's, you could uh, talk to, any of you talk to Dr. Martin and go there and see the facility. I don't think many labs have. So, okay. sir, I, yes, sir. So, I think, okay. sir, that's the end of question session. Sir, it was a, a very interactive and a knowledgeable session, sir. On behalf of uh, School of Biosense and Management of MacPast, I'm very grateful to you for such great interaction with us. It was very informative. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure for me to be with you. And I'm sure a lot of enthusiastic questions. I enjoyed the discussion part, you know, because that's what. The other things, you know, maybe, sorry. but uh, the impact of a lecture is when there are a lot of discussions. Yes, sir. So thank you all very much. Those people who have asked questions, uh, you know, every question has got its own purpose and meaning, and uh, I'm sure I have addressed all the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tina, the, Dr. Uh, uh, Shibu, uh, Dr. Jenny, <laughs> and all those people uh, in my first, and wish you all the best. And have, uh, and I'm sure there are many more lectures to go, isn't it? So Ruby is. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have uh, four more, sir. Uh, okay. Four, five best, more. Five. Isn't it? Thank you. Thank you, the, Thank you There sir. are a lot of webinars happening, but the, this is a yeah. good, good, meaningful webinar. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, thank uh, you, sir. Very good. Congratulations okay. to all of you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, you so thank much. You, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Devika, Devika, Rabarn. I think so. Uh, she Deepthi said it, is, Deepthi had, sir, please stay for the vote of thanks. Deepthi is yeah. there for the vote of thanks. Deepthi? Are you there? Or she has left? No, no. Sir. All of you come to Cliff and see the facility. Please come. See sure, my sir. genomic center and see the work. Yeah, sure, sir. We will definitely. We will. <laughs> yes, Deepthi, you can start. Yes, sir. Good evening, all. Respected and our most distinguished speaker, Professor G. M. Nair, sir. Respected Principal Father Dr. Cherian J. Cortel, our beloved HOD Dr. Jenny Jacob, Research Director Dr. Jodis Kumar, Dean Ms. Bina Cherian, Webinar Coordinator Dr. Sibu Simon committee members, honorable faculties, and my dear friends. I deem it a great honor to propose the vote of thanks to all who have helped us in making this webinar such a resounding success. On behalf of my college, I take this opportunity to propose vote of thanks to those who have directly and indirectly contributed to this webinar on opportunities and challenges in biotechnology research, the current paragraph shift, organized by School of Bioscience and the research firm in association with IQSC. I would like to thank our distinguished speaker, Professor G.M. Nair, sir, for making excellent presentation and making this webinar interesting and meaningful. Thank you, sir. I would like to express our profound gratitude to our principal, Father Dr. Cherian J. Cortel. 
I would also like to thank our beloved HOD, Dr. Ginny Jacob, for her moral support and guidance. A special thanks to Dr. Sibu Simon, sir, for organizing this webinar series. And I also thank our resource director, Dr. Jodis Kumar, sir, and Dean, Ms. Bina Charyan, ma'am teachers for their unflinching support and coordination. I hope this webinar series will help you to strengthen the knowledge in corresponding area. A heartfelt thanks to my friends for their active participation. Believe in yourself and all that you are. Know that there is something inside you that is greater than any obstacle by Christine D. Larson. With these warm words and a kind message, I conclude my words. Once again, I thank all for your cordial cooperation. Thank you, have a nice day. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. 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 Thank you.